Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of this brand new build at Wilder Woods. This winter we're building a tiny house, or a cabin, or maybe a tiny cab. I've never done anything like this before. I've done some woodworking around the house, building shelves, bookshelves, etc., but never built a building. For the pros out there, laugh along at my mistakes, maybe give me some advice along the way. And for the other beginners out there, maybe this will show you what is possible. The right mindset, the right willingness to learn, the right willingness to mess up. You can build a cabin. That's been my mantra going into this, and so far, it's treated me well. A little housekeeping before we get into the video. I wasn't entirely sure if I wanted to make a video series. Uh, I'm also a beginner at making videos, as you might be able to tell. So this first video especially is pretty sporadic. I took footage throughout the day, the days I should say, digging the foundation, pouring concrete piers, but really hadn't focused on developing a video. Case in point, this initial video you're watching now is just cell phone footage I captured while using the excavator to dig out our piers. Uh, I simply hit record and stuck it in my breast pocket without much more thought put into it. Thankfully, this is probably the only cell phone footage you'll see throughout the rest of this video series. So let's talk about the build a little bit. We're building a tiny house, or it's more of a cabin in my eyes, but tiny house size with a footprint of about 20 feet by 10 feet. Initially, I planned to use helical piers for the foundation, bought a handful and got them up to the lot, but really quickly ran into some rock layers that made it near impossible to get them into the ground. I think the first one I got two inches before I hit a rock that I was not gonna be able to get around. Thankfully, I had this mini excavator rented a few days later to do a rough cut for a driveway. And while I had it, I brought it down to the building site and dug out eight holes for concrete posts. For the concrete posts, I used Sono tubes or Quick Tubes, I think was the brand I used, and Big Feet for the bottom, which are nice little flare outs to help with freeze thaw and just increase your general footprint at the bottom of your post. The smallest Big Feet I could buy were 24 inches, which seemed pretty overkill for my situation here. So I actually ended up cutting them down and was able to jerry-rig one big foot into two, which we're gonna outline in this video. After that, we mixed up and hauled a lot of concrete to pour our eight piers and then got started on backfilling, which, you know, pretty much every scoop you're seeing this excavator take out, I had to put back in with a shovel, which was by far the hardest part of this step. I hope you enjoy this first video again. It's gonna improve as we go on. This video is a little sporadic, but if you enjoy it, stick around, hit the like, hit the subscribe, and we'll hopefully see you in the next one as we get building. All right, so here's what we got going on with these big feet. Um, these guys are great. They're gonna help frost heave. Um, help really anchor our footings into place. Um, and I think it's gonna be especially important here because I can't really get deep enough with both the soil type and groundwater to get well below the frost line. So I'm really gonna be relying on these to hold the cabin in place. Um, the problem with them is that they're so wide. I had an excavator to dig out these holes, which worked really well, but these are 24 inches and my holes are about 24 inches. So if they're perfect, it might work, but you know, the center of the holes might be in place or they might be spaced out in a way that we can put our pilings in at the proper dimensions but i don't think that they're absolutely perfect where we can just center these in the hole and have the dimensions we're looking for um, so what i've decided to do is cut these down these nice little vent holes which work really well as a cutting guide so i've already done one it worked well i cut along the perimeter here and essentially had a big foot that was this size to put in the hole. Um, the cool thing about that is that it's a smaller footprint. You still get that, you know, nice effect of the slope at the bottom. When the freeze starts coming down, it'll push it down before it starts to lift it up. Um, but we also have scraps left over. And I think, I haven't tried this yet, but I'm hoping that I can essentially turn one of these into two footings because I can take this and maybe trim two or three of these segments wrapped around 
and secure it to the bottom of one of the cardboard tubes, one of the Sono tubes. Uh, so we're gonna give that a try and we'll see how it goes. So we're gonna use these holes. I don't know if you can see those vent holes. These are guidelines. And you get there, I'm just gonna make one cut up and then follow it around the perimeter. Do it also with a jigsaw with a hacksaw blade. hearing protection today. It's louder than I thought it would be. All right, brought some half inch bolts I had laying around the house. So we're gonna punch some holes in this, see if we can get this stick together. Oof. Man, really wish I had some clamps for this. All right, is that wide enough? Yeah, perfect. Ooh, got a cut right on the tip of my finger, which makes this hard motor skill, fine motor skill stuff hard. But, got that in, hopefully it'll hold. All right, well, now that I've cut the top of the Bigfoot down and then used that bottom layer to wrap around itself and bolt down, successfully made one full-size Big Tut into too many Big Feet. Um, this one is a little more, oh, I don't even know what the right word would be. It's not as flared out as I would like compared to this one. Uh, but I think it's gonna do the job. I'm gonna prioritize using these in the spot that I'm really worried about groundwater and potential freeze thaw, heave, um, and then use these as a backup in spots where I'm not as concerned about it, but you know, better to have it than not. Um, I think the last thing we're gonna have to figure out is how to actually attach this to the tube. The tubes I have are slightly smaller diameter than this diameter here, which I think it's gonna work out just great. It can sit in there. There's maybe a quarter inch on each end, which I wish it was flush, but we're pretty limited with how to actually secure this. So once I have that secured, or once I have it set in, then I'm just gonna use some junk screws I have laying around to fasten it. It really just has to hold um, in place because what's actually gonna hold the thing together, it's almost October, there's still mosquitoes. Um, the thing that's really gonna hold it together is the concrete, right? Like if there's a little gap here, once the concrete's dry, who cares? It just matters for the actual pouring that it stays together and the backfilling is what I'm most concerned about. Um, so yeah, onto that problem. So I was just talking about how I have about a half inch or quarter inch gap around the perimeter of my cut down Bigfoot and the concrete tube. Uh, well, one nice thing about these tubes, um, maybe it's a nice thing, is that they vary by about a half an inch. So while I bought eight inch quick forms, what do they call these? Big tubes, um, they really nest into each other, which is great for transportation um, and just for, you know, it's convenient. You can fit four of these inside of each other, even though they're all eight inches. Um, that also means slightly different concrete numbers. Uh, I don't think it really is gonna matter too much for your calculations there. But it also means that, well, with this form, I had a pretty noticeable gap that I was worried about having to fill. 
this one is a little bit wider and it really sits in there just perfectly. So as long as I'm picky with the tubes I use with these cut down forms, I think they're gonna work great. Let's try it. And easy as that, we've turned three big feet into six. Uh, well, five, one's already in the ground. Uh, pretty excited to give these a try. I think it could be a really efficient way to get the benefit um, without needing as wide of a hole. I mean, if you had an auger that was, I don't know, that diameter, you might be able to put these in with an auger, which to me is one of the biggest downsides of using big feet is that you really need an excavator to get a big enough hole uh, to get that 24 inch diameter. Um, and also gonna save a lot of concrete. They're great, but just that full size Bigfoot would have been doubled, maybe even tripled the amount of concrete I would have needed, which I mean, more concrete's better, especially down low where it's anchoring you in. But also, you know, I think I did the calculation that it was gonna be like 70 bags of concrete to get up here, which, um, you know, hauling that up the mountain, thousands and thousands of pounds, uh, many, many trips, because I don't think my car could carry it all in one. So yeah, uh, pretty stoked on this. We'll see if it works. I might uh, really regret this in a few years. My cabin is all cattywampus from these harsh winters, but uh, yeah, first time for everything. Live and learn. I hope that was informative on how to create two big feet out of one. Moving on to the next portion of the video here, actually placing some of these tubes in the ground. We've got two rows of four. Their rows are eight feet apart and each piling is six feet apart. Every step of the way, digging, placing in a guide rebar, placing the tubes, etc. I was careful to make sure I was staying square. The math here was really easy with six foot and eight foot lengths. It meant the hypotenuse, the long end was 10 feet. So it was really easy just to lay down the tape quick and ch This tube was the only one I really struggled to get level on the top surface, and that was more a function of the cut I made on it versus the actual hole. Yeah, and here you can see I was happy, so just making sure we had 10 foot and 6 foot on our two tapes. The backfill was by far the hardest, most time-consuming part of this job. I dug these holes out with an excavator and refilled them with my back. Unfortunately, this project is going to require a lot more shoveling. It's September, which means snow's coming, and it's coming in a big way. want to come up another inch or so um i mean i want to come up just another inch or so to really get to and maybe even above grade here um this one's really shallow because of that groundwater issue so if i can bring ground up a little bit that is pretty much the same as going deeper um you know you're just adding on to the top instead of going down deeper uh yeah back hill and done feels good that is a lot of work i mean for this project that has been much harder than the concrete uh, much harder than the dig-in. Well, I had a machine for the dig-in, so that makes sense, but working up a sweat, especially because my dirt pile, just the way it's being worked, is all the way over there, which is 20 or 30 feet. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're moving hundreds of shovel loads back and forth, <laughs> that adds up, and I am parched. Definitely worked up a sweat, but hey, it's October. Winter's coming in quick, so every drop of sweat I can make, I'm grateful for. All right, on to the fun part, mixing up the concrete. I had 80-pound uh, bags of Zacrete ready mix. 80-pound uh, bags were good. It seemed like it was about two bags a post, two bags a pier, plus or minus a little bit, depending on the height of the pier and the big feet. You know, those two, once they were cut up, were a little bit different shapes, so they took different amounts of concrete. But generally speaking, it was about two a bag. 
You can see that nice cloud of concrete dust and me getting out of the way. Probably should have been wearing a mask for all this, but in the open air, I was able to let it clear out before really mixing. Speaking of mixing, it was about three liters of water per bag. I think that's what it called for. It seemed to be a little more for each one, but the amount more varied quite a bit from just a splash more to, you know, even up to nearly a full extra liter. Using the rebar to get air bubbles out of the concrete is one of those things looking back that's been a good uh, lessons in patience. I probably should have spent more time on this than I did. I know for the last few especially, I was getting pretty tired, getting pretty bored, and just wanted to be done with it. So I called it quit sooner than I maybe should have. Uh, I still think they're plenty strong, but once I peeled off that cardboard tube, it was pretty obvious the ones I cut short, um, and that's a bummer in hindsight. Wish I would have taken the extra five, 10 minutes and a little more shoulders to really make sure they were all perfect. But hey, uh, lessons learned 
and moving forward will be better. And that wraps it up. All in all, we have eight piers in the ground and before the ground froze. So it's time to move on from back breaking concrete work and start working with some actual lumber. In the next video, we're gonna start framing it up, get the beams up from these concrete posts and then frame up our floor. This project has been a blast so far with its fair share of challenges and mistakes. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you again in the next one. If you're interested in that, you know how to do it, the like, the subscribe. I'll catch you then, and in the meantime, go build something.